So let's just talk a little bit about our maximal domains. So we talked about domains before where that's the input of the function and we had a restricted domain before. So that domain was unrestricted, right? Because x squared really can have any values inputted into it. But we've restricted it with some sort with putting it in a domain so that we've written that right there. So what a maximal domain is, is for certain functions, they aren't able to take certain values just because of that's how they work and how they're mathematically defined. So when the domain is not stated, you can always assume that the domain is the maximal domain. So like for the previous question, the domain was stated. So you just have to go with that domain rather than the maximal domain. So for polynomials, the maximal domain will be R, just like we saw for our parabola just then. We can really input any values in and they would still work. However, for some functions, you can't really take the same, you can't really use the same thing of R because there are certain values where if we tried to put that in, the function would be undefined, right? And it's just mathematical type definitions and you can kind of figure it out from there. Two of the main ones that will be coming up quite a lot is going to be the 1 over x and x squared. Oh, sorry, not x squared, square root of x. So let's think about both of them, but let's think about our 1 over x first. So our 1 over x, right, if we think of how this function kind of looks like, we know that this function kind of looks like this, right? And it has asymptotes along here. Oopsies, that's really wonky, but uh, I don't know if it's re whether should we redraw it or not. I'll redraw it. That's okay. Try to redraw it with better asymptotes. Awesome. Alright. Oopsies. Oh my goodness. Drawing parabolas is always fun. Okay, finally. <laughs> Alright, so that's kind of what it looks like. And we can kind of see that there are going to be asymptotes at x equals to zero and y equals to zero. Right? So what we see here is we can see the asymptotes here and with asymptotes that evidently means that one of the numbers won't be able to be accepted. So what we're going to do here is we kind of think of it mathematically like what wouldn't work with this function, right? So we can kind of go through all the values in our head of what wouldn't work and we kind of figure out that 1 over 0, right? 1 over 0 to us is going to be undefined. as we would know. So it's going to be undefined, which kind of gives us a little problems, right? Because that, and that kind of corresponds to what we think our function looks like. So that's going to be undefined. So essentially what you're going to do here is that anything in the denominator will, cannot be equal to zero. So when you have a function like one over f of x, right, you're going to actually try and solve for f of x equaling to zero to really actually find the asymptotes and where they're located. Um, and that works for any function you basically put at the bottom. And even when we have like composite, I mean, sorry, when we have quotient functions where we have like h of x over g of x, what we can try and do is find what the factors of the g of x are, i.e. we can solve g of x equaling to zero to kind of actually give us what factors can't be um, included. And I guess this is a bit of a fun fact, which might come up in a quite a tricky in exam one question but if you have hx being able to be divided by g of x so for example if you had a common factor between the two so the factor would cancel out top and bottom but there would be an empty circle left there because in the original function it still wouldn't be part of the function overall right because it would still make the denominator zero so we just leave an empty circle there rather than actually putting something in. 
All right, let's talk about root x. So we think to ourselves, all right, with root x, we have to think what under a root would not be defined, right? So if we kind of go through our number system again, we think, okay, broadly speaking, we think about positive numbers, right? We're like, okay, positive numbers work. What about zero? Because zero was the problem last time. Okay, zero should work because root of zero is just zero. Okay, what about negative numbers? Ah, oh, that doesn't really make any sense, right? Because no number squared is actually going to give you a negative number. That is subject to us not working in the complex plane, obviously, but we in methods work just in the real plane and we just keep it that way and we don't need to consider anything outside of the real plane. So what we kind of do is we say, all right, so that means that negative numbers can't be included, right? So we're going to say to ourselves that therefore the square root cannot be less than zero. So in reality, what that means is if we had a root of f of x, we would have f of x is smaller than zero, right? And then we would just solve for that and exclude all of those values. And yeah, because it's smaller than zero, also that means that you'll one have to graph what f of x by itself is, right? Especially if it's not a linear function. Uh, and two, you'll actually have to solve f of x equaling to zero as well, because you first need to find values before you can kind of decide which side of the inequality it will be on. All right, a couple more that we want to chat about. So logs and tans, they are kind of black sheep of their own families, but they're useful ones to know. And in fact, I find that those two functions are quite useful in a lot of aspects. <laughs> so let's talk about, sorry, so let's talk about our log first. So if we consider the graph of what a log looks like, it looks something like this, right? That's what our log looks like. So right away from our log, we can kind of immediately tell that we're going to be working with numbers kind of zero to infinity, right? Well, zero, yeah, zero to infinity, not including zero, right? But if we didn't know what it looked like, we think of a log as a power, right? So if we had a power, which was infinitesimally very small as in very almost negative version of small or if we had like a one put in here right because this is essentially going to be the original this is going to be the original kind of like power complex right because remember if we have e of x equaling to a then we have log e a equaling to x and this was the original output so if we mean that that means that e of x right has to equal to something so e of x has to be able to be equal to that something right i'm sorry e of whatever the thing is e of let's say e of a has to be able to equal to x but we can see that e of x right as a function it never touches zero so that means that x cannot be zero right and it never goes on the negative side so that means x cannot be negative either um, and essentially when we get a negative log what we're implying is that something to the power of something equaled to a negative number right and because we're working with like all positive numbers currently so we're assuming we know that e is positive it's like 2.7 something and we're assuming that Oh, I guess you can try to not assume that x is positive. So if we try to pretend, all right, let's try and find out what's going on here. So if, if we did x is positive, then all is happy. We get this side of the graph. If we tried when x is negative, what that actually means is that e to the power of something, whether positive or negative, so it could be e to the power of negative 1 or e to the power of 1, right? that's going to equal to a negative number, which we can tell is not possible, right? Because even if you put an exponential to a really, 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 really big negative number, it's not going to turn negative. It's just going to become infinitesimally small instead. 
All right, so let's talk about our tan function as well. So tan function, once again, it does have asymptotes. And why we have asymptotes, it kind of comes back to our 1 over x type theory. So tan is sine x over cos x, right? And if we kind of use our 1 over f of x, where we need to solve for f of x equaling to 0, what we're trying to solve for there for is cos x equaling to 0, right? And because it's going to repeat every period, we really only just need to find 1 and then add or subtract periods from it. So we know that cos x will equal to 0 at pi on 2, because kind of if we consider that unit circle, we can see it hits exactly 0 up there. Cool. Awesome. So... For logs, the number inside the log must be greater than zero, and for a tan, the function cannot be any n pi over two. Um, I guess that's also like with the pi n over two, it's it's a kind of subjective thing where not subjective, that's not the right word. Kind of like so, if you had two pi, right? Two pi. 2 pi over 2 that would equal to pi and that gives cos a number so in fact instead of saying this it should be more like 2 n plus 1 pi oh sorry not 2 n plus 1 2 n pi plus pi right or pi 2 n plus 1 right because it's all the odd numbers of pi is what's really actually going to get you the zero down there so just be careful about that. Okay. Alright, so let's move into chatting about a question now. So when we look at this question, um, let's have a go together. So what we want to do is we want to find the maximal domain of this question, right? We have two kind of components to consider here. The third up the top and this denominator, right? So what we can do is actually just consider them separately and then bring them together afterwards. So what we know so far is from 1 over x, the bottom cannot equal to 0. And if we're talking about a square root, this part has to be bigger or equal to 0. Right? So what that means is x minus 9 cannot be equal to 0. So x cannot be equal to 9. All right, with this one, we're thinking, all right, so that's x minus 1 has to be greater or equal to 0, right? Greater or equal to 0. So what that actually means is x will have to be greater or equal to 1. Okay, so now we have these two types of conditions, um, and what we want to do is kind of conjoin those two conditions together, right? So... We have x is bigger or equal to 1, and x does not equal to 9. So what we can do here is, you, there's kind of two ways you can kind of write it. So you can write, you can, okay, you can either write 1 to infinity union, oh, sorry, excluding 9, or you can write it something like 1 to 9 union, with 9 to infinity. Okay? I think this one's a little bit more difficult to write in kind of set notation or inequality notation just because the not equaling to 9 is a bit hard to express without using these symbols in between. But it is up to you what you want to do. Okay. 